Ecclesiastes chapter number 1. We're going to begin reading down in verse number 9. The Bible says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Now in verse number 9, a off-quoted saying at the end of verse number 9, there's nothing new under the sun. About every, I don't know, about every 10 years or so, there are what people call paradigm shifts in scientific, in religious, in almost any type of community, which is where they have acquired so-called new information, and they change what they believe, what they teach, what they propagate based off of that new information. It's always shifting. They are always on unsteady ground because they know what they are saying today may not be true by the end of the year, may not be true by the end of the decade probably won't be what they are teaching 10 years from now. I mean, aside from maybe elementary school teachers, you get up in the middle school or high school, you ask a history teacher things that they taught 10 years ago, they're different than what they're teaching today. Ancient history may be the same, but I remember when my textbooks didn't have 9-11 in the textbooks. I remember watching it. I was at home with bronchitis. I remember on that day waking up and thinking there's something something's off every channel has something about these two towers and I didn't quite understand it at the time but now that's a part of history books now the war on terror has almost been written in stone and then now it's a continuation effort right things which were not now are so they've changed that's not what this verse is it's not talking about new events in history not talking about new understanding for things that before we did not have the capacity to know. This is talking about, doesn't matter what you want to call it, doesn't matter how you want to phrase it, doesn't matter how people may perceive it, the things happening today always been happening. Solomon in his day, I mean, verse number 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. Solomon. Solomon in all the wisdom that God blessed him with because he asked for wisdom so that he may judge God's people correctly in all the wisdom that God had given Solomon he looked around at the world and he came to the understanding that the things that people thought were new in his day were the same thing that was always going on I mean he, it's what, verses nine, what verse number 9 is talking about the thing that hath been it is that which shall be what has happened it's going to happen again may have a different name it may happen a little bit different but it is the same core issue okay then that which is done it shall be done we are as people creatures of habit people have tendencies then you say well we're all individuals well how come so many people go out and make the same dumb mistakes they may do it a different way they may make a different mistake but the core reason why they make it is always the same well, if we are truly unique, how come there are so many people trying to be the exact same person? If we're truly so proud of what makes us special, why do we try to conform to the image of what we think other people want us to be? Well, we're not going to teach on that. Anyway, verse number 10. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? You can, I don't know, back in November, I guess, might have been the first time that we started hearing about this new virus. Can we look at COVID-19 and really say, is this new? No. It may be a new strain of what's called a, you know, Corel Novel virus, but there are at least seven others, and only two of them had we heard about before. One was MERS, which was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and then the other one was SARS back, you know, about a decade and a half ago. But then the four others, we don't even know about them because they say the majority of people already have had them or will have them at some point in their life. Not that big a deal. That coral novel virus, that means that there's no treatment for it. That there's nothing that they can do to prevent you from getting it. Well, they're hoping that they can stop that with this, maybe get a vaccine going. 
But even this type of virus isn't new. In fact, I started to think of it. Well, I mean, viruses, really. I mean, biblically, I can go back to where Moses threw dust up in the air one day and then everybody got boils all over them. Because God said that he was going to plague Israel with boils on their skin from the ashes of the furnace. Right? Well, really, you start thinking about it, boils that keep people from going out. Because Pharaoh called upon his magicians and said they could not come because of the boils. They were so oppressive that they couldn't do anything. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like MRSA that was going on not too long ago? Where people would get these awful infections and they would, you know, metastasize into these boils and it would leave them bedridden. But at the time, everybody thought, well, MRSA, there's this new thing. Now it was a new strain of something. It had gone through a change, but at its core, it was still a disease. MRSA was a mutation of the staph virus. Something we already knew about, it had just changed. But really, disease is disease. Sickness is sickness. In fact, I did a little bit of reading. Didn't know this before. But there are written on ancient papyrus from Egypt documented cases of breast cancer. They didn't call it that at the time. But they noticed that there were these abnormal growths that didn't belong in the body and that it could have, they couldn't prove it at the time, but they said, this shouldn't be here. Because at the time, they mummified the court. They took everything out of the body. So they noticed that, well, hey, that wasn't the same as that other person. That's different. That looks foreign to what should be there. And they say that cancer is an epidemic nowadays. Well, I mean, Hippocrates, doctors today, they take the Hippocratic Oath. It's named after this guy. He was an ancient Greek dude. They call him the father, father of modern medicine. He noticed cancer back in his day. In fact, he's the one that came up with the terms carcinoma. But what, it was a tumor. Cancer's always been around. The problem was is that, you know, I don't know, during the dark ages, the average lifespan was about 40 years. Today we live twice as long as that. If you study out cancer, just like, you know, staph mutated into MRSA, right? Cancer is the mutation of genes into cells that your body can't use, so it lumps them all together. And those cells don't do anything. In fact, they're detrimental to the body. And the longer you go on, the more those cells accumulate, then you get tumors, then it can metastasize into the rest of the body, and then that's when the cancer replaces all the good cells in your body. 75% of cases of cancer are people 60 or older. Because the longer you live, the more those cells accumulate. They didn't have to deal with it back in Bible time because some of them didn't live long enough to deal with cancer. Even with cancer. They said, well, where was it when I was young? It was there. Just by the grace of God, it hadn't affected as many people. Can we look at anything and say, see, this is new? No. Because God made it all in seven days and nothing's been new since then. The only new thing since God created heaven and earth was sin, which man invented. But ever since that day, there's never been anything new. But then, verse number 11, There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. People hear about COVID-19, and they fly into panic. Has two-thirds of the world died? Because that's what happened during the Black Plague. During the bubonic plague, rats on ships transmitted the disease. Today, it was people on airplanes. And there are certainly situations where people are packed in tight and what some may call overpopulation of, you know, seven small islands in New York led to the vast spread of this disease. But people that like their distance over here in Kentucky, not that common. You know why the Black Plague happened? Because people were stacked on top of each other, living in port cities, and it spread like wildfire. But nobody learned that lesson. They're still building skyscrapers. 
They're still trying to pack as many people into the smaller population. Anybody ever remember the typhoid crisis? What happened there? Bad water polluted neighborhoods and it spread. Everybody read about the cholera epidemic? What was that? Overpopulation in small areas. But a new thing happens and they don't change their ways. They just try to react to it. Solomon saying, y'all got the disease isn't anything new. Maybe a new name, maybe a new strain. Every year they say that there's, you know, a new flu thing. Well, it's still the flu. The common cold is still the common cold. No matter how many different versions it can take. There's a whole bunch of different flavors of cheese. They're all cheese. Right? Well, what's the point that he's making? The problem is not the disease. It's what allows the disease to prosper, to propagate. Are you saying, are you, are you saying tear down all cities? No, I'm just saying common sense says, where's the worst problems? Where there's a whole lot more people in a whole lot denser space and they don't have room to move. So it's packed that they have people sometimes who are paid to shove people into the subway doors to make sure that the doors can close because they pack them in there like sardines. You're telling me that the cold doesn't flourish in that situation? You're telling me that the flu doesn't? You're telling me that allergies aren't worse in New York City where you got all those people coughing it in and breathing it out? Of course the problem's worse there. I'm not saying that it makes the problem any less severe. or you know, Certainly there are people that are getting sick and dying. I can't prove that it was coronavirus. I know of two people personally that have gotten it. One of them had a whole bunch of respiratory problems before that. He was susceptible. The other one had it, didn't even know that they had it until they had to mandatorily get tested by their work, and then they found out that they had it, and they were quarantined for 14 days. Didn't exhibit symptoms, just like those other four viruses that we talked about that are the same strand. But see, people go through something, they cope with it, they grieve it, and then they move on and forget it. Verse number 10 is the indictment of mankind that we cannot escape. Doesn't matter how hard a select few try, the vast majority will always forget. I can't remember. I know his first name starts with an E, but his last name was Burke. He said, those that do not know history are doomed to repeat it. He wasn't original when he came up with that back in the 1700s. Solomon said it here in verse number 10. He's saying, or verse number 11, there is no remembrance of former things. The indictment of man is that man cannot get past what's right in front of him. The indictment that Solomon delivers here, it's in chapter number one of Ecclesiastes, he's saying, pay attention. Learn all of Ecclesiastes. He's looking at all the labor of man under the sun, everything that man strives for, everything that man wants to attain, all the effort that man goes through. It's all vanity. Everything that he looked at outside of the grace and the knowledge of God is worthless. You can labor all day today, but if tomorrow God says your time's up, everything you did today was pointless. Yeah, true. He's saying what we labor here today, what makes it permanent? God's anointing on it. Right. He's saying outside of God, nothing matters. Right. Outside of God, it doesn't matter what disease is going to come. It's going to you know, ravage your home. It's going to ravage your life. It's going to ravage your nerves. It's going to change you and affect you no matter what you do outside of God. And who's he writing this to? He's writing this to God's people. The ones that just a few days, few weeks, few hours after they get led out of captivity from Egypt, they're making a false god and bowing down to worship it. No remembrance of former things. And while, I don't know why we're on Egypt so much, but while we're on Egypt, the plague where God smoked the cattle and the camels and the donkey, everything else that Egypt had. All the cows of Egypt died. None of Israel's cows died. You know how I said that those four, four novel viruses that people get, most people have it, never knew that they had it. It's just another cough or just another you know, flu season or a cold season for them. I'm not convinced 
that everybody might have already had it and that those that just put faith and trust in God didn't even know that they had it and until these home test kits come out and people are curious like hmm I wonder if I had it well the plague happened and Israel was in Egypt but it didn't affect them nobody remembers the old time when God just took care of his own nobody remembers I mean you guys do realize that the forefathers of the faith came through the black plague that the forefathers of the faith came through the Spanish Inquisition. That the forefathers of the faith made a voyage across virgin waters in the Atlantic Ocean on ships that probably wouldn't even be seaworthy nowadays with limited rations, limited food, got off and were nearly starved to death in a land that they didn't know how to cultivate and God still made a way for them because they were just seeking his face in a land that they could freely worship him openly God took care of David in caves God took care of others in far worse situations but through all of it those that went through it remember it but the next generation does not those that experience it it may make an impact on them but the next generation is worried about what's right in front of them. Some that even went through it don't remember it. I mean, keep in mind, we can go to the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, uh, Azariah, and can't remember. They go through the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar, king of everything. King of everything says their God's the real God he saw the fourth man in the fire said it looked like the son of God somebody who didn't know God even knew what Jesus looked like Okay. proclaims their God's to be worshipped throughout all the kingdom that, that was everywhere because he was getting everything at the time then Daniel some decades later gets in trouble for asking anything of God which again I've taught this before doesn't say that Daniel bowed his head to ask God for food water everything I'm convinced that Daniel said okay they said I can't ask God for anything I'm just going to bow and worship God for everything he's already given me because he knew God was going to take care of him but anyway what happened between Daniel's day and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego they forgot about what God did in the fiery furnace Daniel didn't Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego if they were still alive and kicking they didn't forget it but the people around them forgot it why did they forget because Nebuchadnezzar went off the scene a new king with new policies a new agenda a new thing was right in front of them and it took all their focus then verse number 11 neither shall there be in remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after meaning what's happening right now a month from now a year from now people are going to forget it when was the last time you thought about how swine flu affected people when was the last time you thought about H1N1 or the avian flu or bird flu when was the last time that you thought about having your oil changed other than when the little light comes on in your car that says you need an oil change? How many people forget to wear their seatbelt until the little seatbelt light comes on? Something they do every day. Forget about it until it's right in front of their face. You know why I put my seatbelt on? Because when I was a kid, my grandpa used to find me. We'd get in the car, and he'd go seatbelt, and then once you got to a certain age, he'd charge you a quarter every time you was riding with him and you didn't put your seatbelt on and, and if he had to tell you to put it on he charged you you got a ticket I remember that why because that was ingrained on me well some Christians have things ingrained into them but the vast majority of others just have things happen to them this is God's chosen people Solomon's writing to he's saying things you're going through today you're not going to remember them because man, we've heard it thought around here, wears a wristwatch because he knows his time's limited. Man knows that he is not eternal. 
The flesh knows that it's only got a certain amount of time, and so it's constantly focused on what's right here in front of us. But there are things, scripturally, do we get in here? God's word's been forever settled in heaven. Yeah. Nothing new right. under the sun. Right. So what are the old things that we can cling to? Some old things that when whatever it is that's in front of us, if we ingrain, as the psalmist said, etch them into the fleshy tables of our heart. Right. Write them upon the foundation of my heart. Yeah. Hidden away in our heart. What's that mean? means it's ever in front of us that in order to see what I'm going through first I have to look through the filter of the things of God I'm still looking at what's in front of me but I'm looking at it with some perspective well how do we do that well first thing let's go back to verse number 10 see is this new certainly when Jesus showed up on the scene they could say well isn't this new isn't Jesus new? The apostles. Eleven of them walked with Jesus every day for three, three and a half years, somewhere in there. Okay, they were with Jesus all the time. They had to get saved just like we got saved. By the blood. So certainly after Jesus went to Calvary, they could say, well, isn't this new? Uh, John tells us that he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. No. When God purposed to make, he purposed that Christ would go to Calvary. In the eyes of God, it was already done. It just hadn't been performed yet. So no, salvation wasn't new. Salvation is just as old as the plan to make light, which he made on the first day. Salvation isn't new. God just did it in a way to prove to us that Jesus was who he said he was. God could have showed up, but if he would have showed up in all his glory, man would have melted away. That's what he told Moses. No man can see me and live. So why would God do something to save people that he just killed by showing up? That don't make sense. Right? Well, the old adage is, well, the surgery was a success, but the patient died. Well, what good is that? Well, some other things that people say, well, certainly that's it. When the Bible was completed, let's say it was translated into English. People that had gone to church for so long over in the Church of England at the time. They went to church. They didn't understand what was going on. It was read in Latin. Right? Certainly the guy would preach to them in English. But then the printing press, Gutenberg, comes along. And then copying a book doesn't take years anymore. It may take a few weeks or a few hours. But as a result, people could hold the Word of God in their own language and they would say surely this is new no we've already said forever settled in heaven and there's half that hadn't even been told so the thing that we think was new is only half of what really has always been there people say well certainly what I'm going through right now is new nope we can go and in the gospels look at where Jesus was tempted how was he tempted of the devil? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Why did Adam send in the garden? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Why did Eve? Same thing. Sin is because we see it and we want it. We want to feel it and we do it. Or because we think we're right and God's wrong. That's sin. What are the fruits of sin? Death. Well, nobody had died like this before, you know, this time period. Who knows how long AIDS had been around and just hadn't gotten to humans yet? Who's doing autopsies on monkeys out in the jungle to see what they died of? Really, they don't even know how it got to mankind. 100%. There's speculations and theories, but... Who cares? It's another disease. I know the one that took care of leprosy. I know the one that a woman had an issue. Here you go. woman with an issue of blood. Spent all her money on physicians. They said, ah, we've seen blood problems before. But we don't know what this one is. You know what? I, I did this for somebody else. So this might help. 
I believe them doctors didn't swindle her. I think they really tried to help her. And she went to everybody that she heard of that knew how to deal with problems like hers, and they couldn't help. But one word from the master, she's healed. Don't matter what the problem is. You want to find why the Old Testament was given to us as our end sample that we would not forget, that we can go back and say, well, you know, David may not have had a corporate nine to five, but he had a whole lot more responsibility than I did. And the people that supposedly wanted God's leader as their king, they rejected David. It even took Israel a while to catch uh, He was king in Judah, Hebron, for seven years before Israel got on board. Right? Those that always say they want the best don't do the best. That's nothing new. There are people going to be closest to you, stab you in the back. Absalom stole the heart of the people away. We can go and look. Even people that are trying their best to live and do what God would have them to do, they still got to deal with the flesh. Samson was a womanizer. Moses did murder a man out of hate and anger for a way that he was abusing one of his brethren. David, fornicator, adulterer, murderer, had bloody hands. That's why he couldn't build the house of God. Solomon, in all his wisdom, bowed down and worshipped false gods at the end of his life because he had forgot God because he didn't heed what God had told the Israelites earlier. Don't take women as your wives from strange lands. They'll turn your heart away from God. Solomon had so many wives, he didn't know what to do with them. Trying to please them all, he bowed down and worshipped false gods in his old age. Because even the one that understood the things which were, people forget, and they will come again, he did it. It was so true that it came true in his own life. He stopped being the preacher, and God used him as an example. Nothing new. So if our problems aren't new, if the things that even God has done for they may have been new to us, but they were never new to God. From God's perspective, nothing has ever happened that one caught him by surprise, or two was something that he didn't allow to happen. Maybe it had never happened to us, but maybe it's been happening in other places throughout history since time in memoriam. That means as long as we can remember. But you say, well, before 1970, homosexuals didn't want the right to be married. Go to Sodom. Well, before 1990, they, they weren't against people praying in schools. They didn't even let Dave, or Daniel pray in his own house. Well, before this COVID thing happened, we never thought that the government wouldn't let us meet and have church. Go read the book, Trail of the Blood. Fox's Books of Martyr. Before they even had a complete word of God, people were meeting and just saying. I mean, even the early church. Before the apostles were even off the scene, they were bringing persecution to the church in Jerusalem. God makes it clear that the reason that happened is because they didn't do what Jesus said and disperse and go and take the gospel to every nation so he spread them throughout the nations but the persecution came and what were they doing they didn't have this what did they do while they were you know the churches in Thessalonica and Philippi and all these other what were they doing when they were waiting on these letters that the apostle Paul pinned to them in the epistles they were just giving what they had heard I'm going to give to you what Jesus gave to me Occasionally a preacher like Titus or Timothy or somebody else would come through that had been hanging out with the Apostle Paul. They'd teach them, they'd preach them something new. But what would they do? They would master it until the next thing came. You want to know why their life looked like Christ? Because Christ would give them one breadcrumb at a time. Because we're just old Gentile dogs. We don't deserve anything. But even the dogs get the crumbs of the Master's table. A little by little they would receive part and they would cherish it so that they would understand every aspect of it. And now we're so spoiled to have all 66 books, not in Hebrew and Greek, but in the King's English, as they would say, 
and we're so spoiled with it, we just hunt and peck around. I thought that I'm supposed to study to show myself approved unto God. Doesn't matter what I know or may understand better than somebody else. Mastery. But people forget that. We don't know why they were called Christians at Antioch. Because they were mastering the things that God gave them instead of just receiving and then letting it wash off of them. There were those. Don't get me wrong. Nothing new. Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted a name. They didn't want a relationship. So they said, we want people to think that we were spiritual if we went out and sold this property. We're going to tell them we gave everything, but we had something back for ourselves. It's a nest egg. That was their right. But they didn't have the right to say that they gave They lied to God and they lied to man. Lied to the man of God. And God said, well, you're going to be held accountable to that. That's not new. Achan did the same thing. Wanted a wedge of gold, some silver, and a Babylonian garment. Like those things more than he liked being a child of God. Not new. It's always been going. But those that apply it, they're the ones that go out and they make a difference. They mastered it because they needed it. I don't need God when my pocketbook gets thin. I can go to the banker. I can pull out another credit card. I can fill out a new application. I can get an advance on the credit cards that I already have. When I get sick, I go see the doctor. When they got sick, especially if they were poor and didn't have the money to go see a doctor, they got on their knees and begged God. Those pilgrims that came over on the Mayflower, and then the other four fathers that came over after, by the way, Rhode Island was the only state that officially had Baptist as the religion of the state. The rest of them were Quakers and everything else. So not all of them believed the right way, but they all sought God and they wanted freedom. I'm not even saying all them Baptists in Rhode Island were the ones that had it. I don't know. Doctrinally right. But somebody got it right because I got it. But as a result, they come over. When they planted their seeds, they seasoned it with prayer. They didn't have fertilizer. Especially if they didn't have cows or some other type of animal to make the fertilizer back in the day. They'd put it in the ground and they'd pray, Lord, I can't make this grow. They're planting up in the middle of Massachusetts. Frigid half the time. Then they landed on the shore. It's a whole bunch of rocks and sand. Well, how'd they get food out of that? God blessed it. You say, well, that, that's a peculiar thing. There's nothing new. God's always made a way when it's a desert place for them to get a drink of water. God's always had a way that when there's rocks and when there's you know, vines and you know, the weeds and everything should choke out the Word of God. God finds a place somewhere where there's good ground and it flourishes. And He's promised that there always will be a remnant. Even after the church is raptured out of here, all them copies of the Bible that have been printed over the years, that's going to remain. How do you think those in the Great Tribulation are going to come to know about Somebody's going to find a Bible, read it, and believe it. The seed will always find a place. To, but what do we have to do? We have to allow it to grow in it. What's that? That's mastery. There have been people since the beginning that ma Enoch got so good talking to God, God just took him to heaven. Can you imagine being so close to God? God says, you don't, this world is beneath you. Come on. There have always been people that have been sold out for the, those that master it make a difference. But with as many people that are mentioned in the Bible, with as many people throughout the ages that may have been blood bought on their way to heaven, how many don't have a place recorded? How many were focused on what's right in front of them? How many of them, instead of looking at things through the perspective of the Word of God and the things of God, they forget everything that they learned at church when the problem shows up at their house. When it's at somebody else's house, they can get all dignified and give you all the biblical information and the counsel that you would need. But when it shows up at their it disappears. Where'd it go? Is it not true? Well, no, if it's true yesterday, it's still true today. There's nothing new under this. I mean, all the false religions today, we can get into that. All their counsel 
It's man's philosophy. That don't pan out. That's why they have to keep changing it. But if if you said, well, it's from the Word of God, I believe it, and, you know, I believe it because God's always true. Well, then when it happens at your house, how come it wasn't that important anymore? When you're the one that's sick, how come all of a sudden you need the best doctor in the world and you need 19 opinions before you'll counsel? How about just seeking God's face on it? If God says, that's the right doctor, that's the right doctor. Why do I need 18 more opinions? Is it because I'm looking for what I want to hear? Most of the time, yes. But how do you know that? Because I'm the same way. I'm never wrong. There, there are days I want to punch holes in the drywall, but I'm not too good at fixing the drywall, so I don't. Yeah, and Ray's very busy right now. And depending on which wall of my room I would punch, there's concrete on the other side. There's our two by four, so that could be bad. But there are those, it happens. But then everything that there, why does it go away? Why is verse number 11 true? Why is verse number 11 always an indictment for people? Because people get caught up in the fields and they get caught up in their ideals. What they wanted to be true didn't come true. There are a lot of people that the reason COVID hit them so hard, as I was studying that, they identified based off of what they got to do. Their identity was wrapped up in who they got to see, where they got to go, and what they got to do. Everything that they thought was of value to themselves was based off of what they were able to do. But then the government shows up and says, hey, you can't do that no more. And now they don't know who they are anymore. They're going crazy. Some of them Christians have no idea what they're going to do now. Their earth was shaken to the core because they couldn't go out and do this, 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 and this. Well, I mean, by the grace of God, I have a job. I'm thankful for it. I like the people that I work with. I don't take that for granted because that hadn't always been true. Right? I like the fact that I have a place to lay my head dead in a cave. God said having food and raiment, be content therewith. Because some of them slept in caves. Jesus only had a rock for his own pillow while he was here. He'd taken good care of me. But if the job were to disappear, Lord willing, I'd still be here on Sunday morning teaching Sunday school. Because my identity is not caught up in my job. My identity is not caught up on where I live or who I associate with. In fact, those that know me best know, I don't hang around that many people. People make me anxious. I don't like people because I don't understand people. People are confusing and I can't figure them out, Brother Randy. They don't make sense to me. Maybe it's because I'm so weird that nobody else makes sense to me. I don't know. I understand me, but I don't understand everybody else. And truly, I don't understand me because my heart's deceitfully wicked and no man can know it. All I know is is what God's allowed me to be so far. But my identity is not caught up in other people and how I get to associate with them. Truly, Brother Brian, all I know is, is that this is true and that I don't deserve anything that he wrote down. But some people get past that. Or they never allow that to mature in their life. And are there days that I forget it? Yep. But on every day that I forgot it, the Holy Ghost is there to remind me. Yeah. On the days that I'm starting to, you know, forget, I'll find a verse that reminds me of it. Because those that are commit will constantly have their eyes shifted from here to there. Right. Onto Him. Because some people don't like when they lay their head down on their pillow who they are on the inside. Most of the time if they're Christians it's because they're under conviction when they think about what it is that they need. And all of us should get under conviction when we think about what we're doing for God and what God would have us to do because there's always more we could be doing. If you ever get to the point that you stop feeling conviction, chances are not only you're out of the will of God, you're so far away that you're like the prodigal. You've got to come to yourself in order to get back to the Father's house. 
Because conviction is a day in, day out thing. Sometimes he convinced convicts us or convinces us that we need to get closer other times he convicts us that we're right where we need to be either way conviction's always there conviction is not always a miserable thing in fact conviction is not what's miserable what's miserable is when we say no to when god tries to convict us of something and we get miserable because god says well if you don't want me no fellowship but see people don't like conviction so they stay away from the house of God. Well, then they lay their head down on their pillow at night and they know that what they should be doing, they're not doing. So they busy themselves with things to keep themselves occupied. And when all those things disappear, they don't know why they're living. Why will people tomorrow, next week, next year, if the Lord gives us more time and blesses us before the rapture with another generation will they learn about COVID in schools no you know why they won't learn about it in schools because by then there will be about a thousand different things that have happened since that have been more serious and those will go in the books why will the next church generation not remember the time that churches were shut down because the government said so and it was an infringement upon our rights and not only our rights but it was an infringement against the word and the principles of the word of God they trespassed against heavenly doctrine why won't they remember it because it's not happening to them why did this generation take for granted that we live in America you realize that America's taken rights and privileges away from people for hundreds of years? Ask the natives. Ask the African Americans. Ask those that were considered undesirable at the time. Ask Irish people in New York City after the potato famine. Ask the Italians in New York City. Ask Jews wherever they've been throughout all of history if people can make you not only undesirable, but try to exterminate you. And then with the same groups of people, look to those that followed after God if God didn't preserve them and allow them to prosper. But we don't remember that. We just remember that every day I wake up and there's hardness in my life right now. Well, the thing that is hard for me is always easy for God. But we don't remember that. We, remember, we wake up and we think, man, today I'm pushing this millstone. I've been blinded. I'm chained to these two pillars. See, God hadn't forgot Samson. Samson hadn't forgot God. Samson didn't cry out to God because Samson was knew one, he was there because he put himself there. And two, he was ashamed. Why did Peter jump in the water when he was naked out there on the boat fishing? Because he was ashamed that the Lord saw him like that. He didn't understand that the Lord had seen him before that, before the, Jesus showed up on the coast. He's everywhere all the time. He knows everything. He'd forgotten that God was always with him and then that's why he allowed himself to be in that situation. But when Jesus was right over there, he had to hide himself. He was ashamed. Even when he got himself put back together and on the shore, I can just see him staring in the fire. He's not looking at Jesus. Jesus is talking to him. He's not really paying attention. He's just looking into the fire. He's all, oh, hey, did you guys hear that over there? It's like a lot of people in churches trying to find anything to pay attention to other than the preaching. Or they'll pay attention to the preaching until the Holy Ghost starts dealing with them about what they're hearing. Then they're tuned out. Like the people in the parking lot, if they're out there listening to the radio broadcast on the FM transmitter, uh, they can change the station and tune God out. You can do that for a time. But there'll come a time that God won't allow you to tune them out anymore. Why does all... Because people forget that the business of God is serious business why did Solomon through the inspiration of God write this down for the people of Israel because he knew one not everybody had a desire for the wisdom of God he looked around in the book of Ecclesiastes he looked at everybody doing everything in every type of way trying to find something where somebody was doing something good for the honor and glory of God he said they're not doing it so he said, I know this generation isn't going to hear it, but maybe the next generation will. 
and so many generations after, those that weren't even a part of God's chosen people but were grafted into the vine, hallelujah, can still read what he wrote down and allow God to do business with it and say, Lord, I want to remember. But you want to know what memory has attached to it? A lot of people are focused on what's right in front of them because they don't want to remember the hard times of the past. I mean, there's, there's some Bible stories you get to read them, Brother Brian. You might be depressed about halfway through. You think, man, there's no hope. That, I mean, you could read the book of Job for a long time and go without a whole lot of hope. But thankfully, at the end, we get it from God's perspective. You know why the book of Job? To show us that we're not the only ones. But also, Job did it the right way. In all this, Job did not sin against God. In everything he did, he grieved, he had pain, he dealt with what was in his life, but he did it according to the way that God said to deal with it. That's why Job made it into the Bible. Not because he had a really bad day, because he had the worst day that I've ever heard of, but on top of it, didn't sin against God. That's the test. But in order to remember that lesson, we've got to remember the hardness of Job. We've got to remember the pain. We've got to remember the times that we were wrong and God corrected us. We've got to remember when we failed so that God could come into our life and be what we were not. The reason I want to focus on right here and right now is because I can convince myself right now I'm the biggest man in the room. I'm the smartest man in the room. I've got the most sense of anybody in the room. I know how to handle this situation in the room. Because if I think about yesterday, I'm going to realize all the times I messed it up. If I think about tomorrow, I'm going to have to admit that I don't know what's coming tomorrow. That there's nothing I can do about it. And the flesh don't like that because the flesh likes surety, assurance. It likes to know what's going to happen. Doesn't like to use faith. Why does man forget? Because man doesn't want to remember all the times that man was miserable and sorry and no good. And God did in spite of man. Yeah. Why will the next generation not remember? Because they want to think that they were the best architects ever. Show me something in New York City that hasn't rusted or fallen down, and yet the Colosseum's still standing over in Rome. Y'all yeah. do realize part of the temple that Solomon was allowed to build is still around over in yeah. Jerusalem. Yeah. After all the wars, after all the conflict, after all the new regimes and the rebuilding... It's still there. Because God put it there. God wanted it to be there. And instead of seeing it as a testament of what God gives us, God will not take away from us. But we can't allow to have stolen from us or we give it away to other people. They use it as a place to offer up vain repetitions. They built temples over the tomb where really the temple should be on Calvary. Yeah, right. They build great edifices of etchings of Jesus' face because they don't want to remember what he really looked like. Because yeah, if they get a glimpse of who he is, he's got eyes like fire. Yeah. He's got a complexion like brass. Yeah. His hair and his raiment's white as wool. Yeah. He's got a voice of many thunderings of many waters. But they want to see him as a meek and lowly individual that never raised his voice that allowed people to walk all over them so that they can walk all over them. People forget because people don't want to admit that they are not enough. But those that do understand, I can never be enough, can always have the one that has always been enough to conquer anything in their life. That's why it takes the size of the grain of a mustard seed. You ever seen one of them? Real small. Real tiny. You know why it only takes a little bit of faith for God to move our mouth? Because I'm not that big. Doesn't take a whole lot of faith to be stronger than Jordan. Because I'm weak. The arm of flesh can't even succeed for me. That's how weak I am. It's not just that the arm of flesh may fail you. No, no, it's always going to fail you. Because you can't even pick yourself up. That's why it only takes a little bit of faith. But that little bit of faith is lacking in so many because they look in the mirror at something that's desiccated, something that has no power, something that's been cursed by sin, and they think, I can turn that into something. Yeah, a mess. 
But we forget that lesson. And we don't wait because we think we're different. The greatest lie of the devil is you're different. Well, you may be a different person because God made you the way that you are. And he loved you just the way that he made you. Enough to die for you. But the stuff that he made you out of is the same stuff that he's made everybody out of. You're not different. You just shaped a different way. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.